It's Anonymous MD with Dr. T. Um, and Lisa. Dr. T brings the real and refreshing insights, straightforward, evidence-based, and up-to-date. Now here's the doctor and Lisa. And we're back, episode six, part two of our mental health mini-series. Lisa, as usual, nice to have you. Thank you so much. So nice to be here. Happy to have Dr. Kotze back today. Yes, we have Dr. Kotze back. Again, uh, he's a a child and adolescent family psychiatrist. He's the uh, former chairman and chief at the Humber River Regional Hospital for their uh, uh, child and family uh, inpatient mental health service, and he's been a uh, resident of Toronto for 35 years and is also on the board and a founder of a wonderful charity called Caring for Young Minds. Please check them out, caringforyoungminds.ca, where we leave no children behind. And what they do, we didn't talk about it last time, is they help uh, uh, families who are underserviced and uh, aren't as fortunate uh, to purchase educational um, uh, devices and to train their teachers in ways to help them overcome very serious mental health disorders that are presenting extremely early in life. So what Caring for Young Minds does is it, it takes children who are suffering from serious mental health disorders and giving them an opportunity to become functional in society. So it's such an important, important mission and uh, it's so unique. So thank you for joining us again, Dr. Kotze. Thank you. Nice to be here. Um, so, you know, as usual, let's uh, do a couple housekeeping things. Let's go over some numbers, although they don't really matter much because they're probably not very accurate. But uh, as of today, around 2.6 million cases around the world of COVID-19 and around 183,000 deaths. Uh, we need a correction to make from last uh, uh, episode. Uh, I don't think I was clear. I want to be clear. Mental health disorders is the largest cost to human productivity and human disability in our workforce. So it is extremely important of a topic. And I don't think I made that very clear last time. So we heard you loud and clear this time, doc. We're good. But so today, I mean, what we had to do is last time was going so well, and there was just such important information that was being shared with us that we impromptu split up our mental health um, podcast session into two episodes. And so today, I think um, we're going to elaborate on how we can cope with this COVID-19 lockdown. Uh, Last episode, we identified more of our vulnerable populations. And now that doesn't mean that everybody who's in that vulnerable population is suffering but it means that we should look out more astutely for perhaps some people who need help in those vulnerable populations. And That's I think right. today we're going to talk about how we can do that. Right. So we, we learned about the people we should really look out for. I mean, we should look out for everybody in our social circles um, as much as we can, and maybe for some people outside of them. Um, but, um, you know, we there are certain ways to help each of those vulnerable populations. But I think that today we're going to talk about a way that can help everybody. What do you think, Dr. Katz? You ready to go? Yeah, uh, I am. I think I need somebody. Everybody needs somebody. When all of a sudden your life is taken away from you and you're told uh, that you can carry on with your normal life and you have to tolerate a lot of silence, lack of activity, um, not enough stimulation. So I I think everybody needs some some time to sit down and see how I'm going to do this uh, and how uh, I can cope with it the best way possible. Particularly that, keep in mind, we don't know for how long everybody's talking about timeline different than it depends on the region, depends on the profession, depends on the circumstance, the financial situation. So nobody knows actually for how long we're going to be on a lockdown. 
And, and we need to really emphasize that point. I have concern of trying to set hard, fast deadlines in terms of things going back to normal. Even this whole concept of us going completely back to normal, this idea concerns me if people are holding on to that. I think we maybe need to start thinking about what a new normal is going to look like. And uh, mm -hmm. I know Lisa's also uh, alluded to that too in, uh, in some of our previous podcasts as well. That's right. And if we consider the fact that normal doesn't exist and that nothing was ever normal, it'll be a lot easier for us to come to terms with that. So let's remember that. Yeah. Uh, so let, let, let me start by saying that when it comes to behavioral science, uh, we learn a lot by observing people, observing societies, observing communities, indiv observing individuals. And then we come up with certain uh, observations that people who acted this way uh, were able to overcome uh, excessive anxiety, low mood, uh, desperate feelings, and so on. So it is important for us to go back and find out what is the best way for us to cope with a forced lockdown. This is not a time uh, for us just to let ourselves go along without putting it some, some reflections and some, some thoughts into it. And we also so talked we, about um, routine and structure um, at last visit. Now, I, I, I just wanted to ask a, a quick question, even in, in the pre-COVID era, um, usually when I was dealing with patients of mine who have mood disorders, such as excessive anxiety or, or, or major depressive episodes, um, I would recommend a, a psychological uh, method that we know of as cognitive behavioral therapy. And um, I wonder when you talk about you know, how we can create that structure in our daily routine, if there's a role for cognitive behavioral therapy, not just for our patients, in our vulnerable populations that we identified last episode, but also for somebody who doesn't necessarily have any mental health disorder or any mental health condition that they're dealing with. Yeah, this is very good, uh, very good point actually, because the way we look at uh, low mood, the way we look at uh, excessive anxiety, this is a human experience and we should look at it on the spectrum of the level of and degree of anxiety of low mood. Not everybody feeling down or feeling anxious, uh, we label it as disorder. But definitely there is a lot more low mood, a little bit of feeling down and, and, and a little bit of an anxiety uh, when you're dealing with a crisis like the one we're dealing with. But let me go back to the origin of what you mentioned about the, the uh, cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. It all started with, uh, in the 60s, when it started to look at certain uh, way for people to feel and experience excessive anxiety uh, while other people are not experiencing the same distress. And when we traced these uh, individuals and the way they look at things, we discover that their perception of the situation is rather distorted and often not based on facts. And then we started to look at how about if we feed these people and train them to look at situations differently and perceive it differently. And we found out that many of them, they experienced rather within normal range of anxiety or within normal range of um, mood concern. And that's why we started really to say, this is very effective, it's long lasting, and you train people to think this way. So you take it from one specific situation and you start to train them to use it in other situations. Yeah, I mean, what, when, what I'm taking from what you're saying is that, you know, in the 60s, 
we really started to find a role for cognitive behavioral therapy. We'll call it CBT from now on, just you know, for for the sake of efficiency during the podcast. So CBT, um, you know, in the sixties. But over the years, we know from uh, study after study that cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, even without the use of medications in some cases of depression and anxiety can have profound effects on, on changing the ways that uh, our patients are able to view the world and in effect control their emotions. And it actually goes back to this human gift, what separates us from all other animals, which is the frontal cortex. And it allows us to use our frontal cortex to process information, thereby exerting more control on the reptilian parts of our brain, such as yes. the amygdala, for example. So you're talking about really the executive part of the brain taking charge. And we have a strong connection between our thoughts and how our thoughts affect our feelings. And based on our feelings, we start to act or make decisions or not act. It depends really on the situation. But so Lisa, as someone you... who's, who's, who's not a, a physician herself, although uh, mm -hmm. brilliant than most, more brilliant than most, um, what would you say it would be a question you would have for a psychiatrist regarding cognitive behavioral therapy and CBT? Well, I think the best way to, um, I, I'm going to say what I understand of it and tell me if I'm, I'm correct, is that, um, you know, maybe people don't, aren't always aware of the way they're thinking about something and that it's not the only option and the only way to think about it. Um, and that by changing and reframing the way they're looking at something, it can change the entire situation and it can change their mood and their feelings about it. Right. Is that this accurate? Is exactly that. This is exactly the, the, the description of the connection between the thoughts, the feelings and actions. And let, let me use a very quick example. Everybody's talking about getting angry. Uh, so I talked to so-and-so and he blew up and he was angry or somebody did something or said something and I became angry. People forget that anger is a secondary feeling. It is a generic feeling. But actually before we feel angry, we have a, another feeling before we get angry. If you hum humiliate me, I feel angry. If you rip me off, I'm gonna feel angry. If you uh, cross uh, uh, my... Um, or if you insult my beliefs or things I feel strongly about, I'll feel angry. So many people just start to look at themselves as getting angry. But actually, there is another feeling before that. When you feel some people, when they feel helpless, they get angry mm. or afraid. And that's why I'm or saying. So that's mm -hmm. why I'm saying when people have time, like. We have all the time in the world with COVID-19 uh, lockdown. Spending some time reflecting on the way you think about the situation, the way you actually, how you best manage with your household, uh, with your responsibilities. You have time. Ref people, some people call it meditating. Some people call it reflecting. Some people call it yoga. Some people call it anything right. you want. So, so for Dr. Kazi, I'd, I'd just like to, for our listeners here, because we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, and we can actually tease the two apart. We can tease it into cognitive therapy and behavioral therapy. And the cognitive behavioral therapy is really this whole idea of identifying distortions in the way we're thinking about processes and thereby leading to more negative emotions, where with practice and a lot of practice at that, we can learn to identify distortions, prevent them, reframe our thoughts, and thereby have better control over those negative emotions. So that's kind of the cognitive therapy aspect. Now you alluded to the can yoga. Just, and the, yeah, please go ahead. No, correct me. Just, please uh, correct. No, it's not really an explanation. Like when we talk about cognition, we talk about two levels of cognition. It is the way we think 
and the contents of our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Which really, the way we think, we rush into the half empty in the cup. But also the contents of the thoughts could be uh, a lot of assumptions and, uh, and a lot of distorted facts rather than the reality. So this is kind of the cognitive therapy aspect of CBT. And then you alluded to where people talk about the walk outside or the yoga or the meditation, or I cooked a nice meal, or I called an old friend who I'd been thinking about for a while. And I think this is really the behavioral therapy uh, uh, component of CBT that's also intertwined as well. Is that correct? It is intertwined because if I believe that um, my old friend doesn't really care to hear from me, I will not make a phone call. But if I really look at the relation, but find out that it is my mood that is distorting my perception of the relationship. And many people are surprised to make a phone call and say, well, wow, this, he really welcomed me reaching out and he was very happy to hear from me. And, so, I wonder if Lisa will ever stop being happy hearing from me six out of seven days per week. Um, that, never. On the seventh, good. I am bereft. Yes. Um, <laughs> now, Dr. Uh, Kodzi, I think it might be really useful for us to give an example in real life of how some, so you just gave a really good one of, you know, you're thinking about calling your friend and you think, ah, this person doesn't really want to hear from me. I'm going to bother them. They're probably doing something really important and I'm boring. And, and so in that case, wouldn't it be me just really thinking that I'm psychic and I can predict what the other person is thinking? But that's why I'm saying we, we have a lot of, we make a lot of assumptions mm -hmm. and many of our assumptions base, are, are baseless. And it is most of the time reflecting the way we feel and our mood. Like I'll give you an example, another example. If somebody is walking into an office and, and the person is really experiencing high anxiety, all of a sudden he is feeling uncomfortable and then he will find reason to justify his discomfort rather than it is actually waiting for him in an office or in a get together, uh, family get together in a in certain occasion. So we, our mood and our, our feelings are often projected on a lot of situations and then we justify it with certain notions, with certain ideas, but I think it, it makes sense, like, you know, when people say, well, just ask, uh, do you want me to drop by? And if somebody says no, it's no, it's not the end of the world. But we're saying we're not going to ask because I know the answer. How often that happens? Right. That, that example you just gave of somebody going into an office with anxiety. Um, so would that be that they they are having sort of that negative feeling to begin with that negative thought and then projecting it onto, let's say the receptionist and saying that she was rude and dismissive without there actually being any evidence of that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And, and, and that happens a lot more often than people think. So it, it, I think I got there in the last podcast, we made a reference to the, the older people when they feel that they have all this uh, news and information and statistics and uh, how vulnerable they are and all of a sudden they say well it could happen it may happen probably I should start acting now and all of a sudden they are in a very morbid mood and looking at funeral arrangements, what kind of music do you want to play, and what, all sorts of stuff. Other than when you really look at the facts, a very good chance you're not going to be one of the statistics on the news one day. 
Dr. Kaz, thank you. So, you know, thank you so much for going into what cognitive behavioral therapy is, and also emphasizing the fact that now we have the time to practice this. You know, I don't think this is something that comes easy to people, and it it requires a lot of practice. It's the same thing as shooting a basketball. It's going to take you ten thousand shots from the free throw line to become a ninety percent free throw shooter. And so I always uh, try and and talk to my patients, especially during these COVID-19 days of, of dedicating a certain amount of time towards some cognitive behavioral therapy, even if they don't have a history of mental health disorder. Mm -hmm. So I just want to take um, a few minutes. I'll post on our Instagram account at the real anonymous MD, um, some of these resources, but they're great self-directed CBT resources in different mediums. There's a book that you can purchase anywhere really it's called mind over mood there's also a website out of australia which is a very structured cbt program called moodgym.com.au so if somebody prefers to work on a browser they can check that one out there's also a, an app i know it's on the apple store it's called the mood kit app and it's kind of an on-the-go cognitive behavioral therapy app. It's very useful for situational, I need to take a moment off to myself to just cool down, pull out the app, go through the situation that's giving you angst, and figure out that distortion, reframe your thought, and try to take the steps. Now, it's all easier said than done. It takes a lot mm. of practice, but we know, and this is evidence-based, that psychological therapies are just as effective in many cases as medications we use for depression and anxiety. And in fact, when we put them together, we don't have additive effects. We have synergy, um, which is a wonderful thing as well. Um, so uh, I, 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 if there were any closing thoughts or, or one final message uh, uh, at the at the end of your two part mini series, we thoroughly enjoyed having you, Dr. Kotzi. What what would your message be for um, the people coping through this lockdown right now? Well, I I am gonna uh, give a quick story about uh, a family physician uh, was here in Markham uh, in the outskirts of Toronto uh, sometime in the eighties. Uh, he used to be a, a very anxious guy and. And he ended up uh, writing a book uh, called The Joy of Anxiety. And actually, he went to all publishers. Nobody agreed to publish. Uh, he did mortgage his house, and he was a very strong believer in the book. And it was a big hit. And he actually gave up practicing medicine, and he was uh, touring all over the world talking about the joy of anxiety. So a little bit of anxiety is not bad. A little bit more could make you uh, rather more industrious and, and active. Uh, and don't listen to people saying that we are actually uh, driven by our, if our emotions and feelings. I think our mind is still uh, in charge of our emotions and feelings. People could make a decision not to feel certain way or excessive way and try and as you mentioned once you persevere there is always very good rewards at the end so to end end off our, our series or and, and our episode um i think today, that we should um, i recap. could either we could we could do a recap i could either sing the 2c slide by drake which probably wouldn't be helpful at all Maybe, maybe we'll do that another time or never, <laughs> or we can recap. I'm so going to have to listen to it on the phone later, folks. Just yeah, know that okay. I'm saving you all. Yeah. Let's do a recap. Well, let's talk about what we went over today really quickly. And I think we did a really good job of talking about something that's rather complex in a short amount of time. So well done, gentlemen. Um, I think that... Um, we're talking about that CBT started in behavioral science, observing what people did and how um, certain people and the way they uh, thought about a situation helped them to get past that situation. And so giving other people who maybe are not getting past things like anxiety or low mood quite as easily, that same thought pattern 
to put their executive brain, their frontal lobe into action, um, helps them to create the emotion that they want to experience. So thought equals feeling and not the other way around. So if I'm washing a dish and I drop that dish and break it, and my thought is I never do anything right, I always ruin everything. I'm probably not going to feel that great about myself. If my thought is, oh, shoot, oh, well, that's a broken dish. I guess I'll use another one next time. I'm not going to be that upset about it. And I think that's a really, you know, give me the layman's terms of that being a really simple way of thinking about what you're saying to yourself really does matter. And it takes practice to be able to think like that for some people, especially it's along a spectrum, I would say. I don't think we want to just, you know, label people, um, Mm -hmm. but uh, along a spectrum of anxiety or depression or other mood imbalances. But it takes practice to be able to look at that broken dish and say, hey, that's not going to be the last dish I ever break and Mm -hmm. it's okay. And yeah, uh, let's maybe you'll be at a Greek wedding and you'll break a dish for a fun reason. We don't know. Yeah. And, and one last point to recap is we have time now. Ta- now is time for self-improvement and, and we can still be productive in very gainful ways that doesn't involve employment and making money and the rat race. And so I'll, again, like I said, I'll put on some of these self-directed um, uh, CBT resources on our uh, at real uh, at the real anonymous MD Instagram account. Um, this is also a call to governments uh, and the government of Ontario. We may want to consider making psychological CBT services way more accessible through the use of technology and video conferencing to help our population and relieve the burden that it has on our disability claims and on our productivity in our economy. And uh, we may find that if we take these types of steps, it may turn into a more productive economy overall. And not only that, uh, a more pleasant, less stressful workplace and and better work-life balance. So lots to think about. So much to think about and so much positivity to be gained from today's episode, I think. So let's remember to listen to us wherever you get your podcasts and remember to follow, subscribe, and hit that bell, which is subscribe on YouTube. Thanks so and much, gentlemen. Notification. Thank you, Dr. Kotze. Next week thank we'll you have... For having me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next week we're going to talk about musculoskeletal health during the COVID-19 shutdown and have... Uh, a uh, wonderful physiotherapist, Tara Cameron, come join us and answer some questions on some ways we could do some behavioral therapies that involve the health of our uh, muscles and ligaments and bones and joints. That's right. All those parts that are holding our brain in and, and up, we need that too. So we need that stuff. too. Yep. All right, everybody. Well, have a good week and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the show. Subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. On YouTube, smash that bell. That's a notification button. Anytime the doctor knows something, so will you. Stay healthy. See you next time.